Ratnath marching on India continues to see nationwide unrest as doctors continue their strike calling for justice for the trainee doctor victim contagion concerns Congo holds on to hope as vaccine delivery process speed up to fight against monkeypox passing the torch a tearful goodbye for Biden's election dreams as Harris receives his fullest endorsement Meanwhile, Trump's camp conducts counter-programming against the DNC. And time to tango! The World Tango Championships in Argentina see a creme de la creme of the dancing world at a centre stage. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Varnasuriya. A very good evening and thank you for taking the time to join us on World News. We have a few new updates to key stories that we have been following throughout and we begin in India. Health workers across India refused to end protest and declined to see non-emergency patients following the killing of a 31-year-old medic who police say was raped and murdered at a hospital in the eastern city of Calcutta where she was a trainee. A colleague of the trainee doctor who was raped and murdered in Calcutta says the gruesome crime has left her mentally traumatized and scared to go to work. The victim had settled down for a rest in a college lecture hall after working nearly 20 hours of her 36-hour shift. The colleague says she has not been able to sleep since the August 9th attack. She says there's an atmosphere of fear in the absence of any concrete reassurances from authorities regarding their safety and security. The attack has sparked a wave of protests, and doctors across the country have declined to see non-emergency patients. A police volunteer has been arrested and charged with the crime. The government has urged doctors to return to duty, while it sets up a committee to suggest measures to improve protection for healthcare professionals. A recent monkeypox case in Pakistan have been classified as clade 2B, differing from the clade 1B strain possible for the current outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, according to Pakistan's health ministry. Which clade 1B has not been reported in Pakistan, and Swedish officials recently identified a clade 1B subclade in an individual, marking the first case linked to the African outbreak outside of Africa. The World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus declared last week the uptick in mpox cases in the DRC and other African countries as a public health emergency of international concern. Mpox, formerly called monkeypox, is a virus epidemic in several African countries. About 18,737 suspected or confirmed cases of mpox were reported in Africa since the beginning of the year across 13 countries, claiming more than 500 lives. The WHO last week sounded its highest level of alert over the outbreak in Africa after cases in the DRC spread to nearby countries. There have been 27,000 cases and more than 1,100 deaths, mainly among children. In the DRC, since the current outbreak began in January of 2023, symptoms include fever, body aches, weakness, headaches and rashes. Currently, there is no treatment approved specifically for mpox infections. For most patients with mpox who have intact immune systems and don't have a skin disease, supportive care and pain control will help them recover without medical treatment. The viral infection can spread, according to WHO, through close contact with an infected person. The Democratic Republic of Congo is set to receive its doses of the monkeypox vaccine thanks to support from Japan and the United States. This delivery aims to close the vaccine access gap that became evident between African countries and Europe and the US during the 2022 outbreak. Earlier on Monday, Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare said in an email statement that it was preparing to provide Congo with mpox vaccines and needles in cooperation with the World Health Organization and other partners. Their arrival would help address a huge inequity that left African countries with no access to the two shots used in a 2022 outbreak, while the vaccines were widely available in Europe and the U.S. Global vaccine group Gavi said last week it had up to $500 million to spend on getting shots to impacted countries. The DRC's health minister said, quote, Gavi has offered to make the vaccines available and we agreed. 
The World Health Organization declared MPOX a global public health emergency last week for the second time in two years, as new variant Clade 1B spread rapidly in Africa. The DRC has 16,700 recorded cases and over 570 deaths, the health minister said. The Philippines and China accused each other of ramming vessels and performing dangerous maneuvers in the South China Sea. The latest flare up after the two nations agreed last month to try to manage disagreements at sea. Unidentified foreign vessel of Sabina Shoal. The incident occurred near Sabina Shoal in the early hours of Monday morning. China's Coast Guard said a Philippine vessel had ignored repeated warnings and had deliberately collided with its boat in an unprofessional and dangerous manner. The Philippines disputed Beijing's account, accusing it of imposing its version of facts. It said two Coast Guard vessels had encountered unlawful and aggressive maneuvers from Chinese vessels, resulting in structural damage to both vessels. The Chinese Coast Guard released this video of the incident, showing what it said was a Philippine Coast Guard ship deliberately ramming one of their vessels. The Philippines said the video is misleading. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said China would continue to take lawful, resolute and forceful measures to safeguard its territorial sovereignty, maritime rights and interests. The US has condemned the incident. Australia and Indonesia signed a treaty-level defence cooperation agreement which allowed the Australian and Indonesian militaries to operate from each other's countries as per the Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Albanese told a joint press conference in Canberra with Indonesian President-elect Prabowo Subianto that the deal will be a vital plank for the two countries to support each other's security, which is vital to both the countries, but also to stability of the region that they share. Australia and Indonesia share the world's longest maritime boundary and already collaborate on a number of issues, including security, people trafficking and drug smuggling. Australia has struck a number of defence deals in recent years, most notably the AUKUS military alliance with the United States and Great Britain that has angered China. Well, let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House tonight, President Biden delivered his highly anticipated address to the Democratic National Convention and touched on a variety of subjects including strong criticisms of former President Trump and the conflict between Israel and the Hamas terrorist organization in control of Gaza as his enthusiastically endorsed Harris. Meanwhile, former President Trump's campaign launched a counter-programming effort in Chicago with two big-name surrogates who hammered Vice President Kamala Harris on inflation and the economy. A tearful Joe Biden took center stage on opening night of the Democratic National Convention, delivering a farewell speech to the party he has served for half a century after he reluctantly ended his re-election bid in July and endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris to replace him on the Democratic ticket. Biden praised Harris and her running mate Minnesota Governor Tim Walz as the best hope for preserving American democracy. Meanwhile, the Republican camp Senator Ron Johnson and Senator Rick Scott stood in front of several charts that demonstrated rising prices on food and necessities at the Trump International Hotel and Tower in Chicago. The senators slammed the current state of the economy, specifically hitting Harris and President Biden and their administration for facilitating inflation increases. Last week, Harris's campaign announced a sweeping economic platform, which included a crackdown on corporate price gouging in the food industry. Harris revealed she plans to implement the first ever federal bank on the practice. The US accused Iran of launching a cyber operations against the presidential campaigns of Donald Trump and Kamala Harris and targeting the American public with influence operations aimed at feigning political discord. US intelligence officials say Iran is to blame for cyber attacks on both American presidential campaigns. 
On Monday, the FBI and two other agencies said in a joint statement they had seen increasingly aggressive Iranian cyber activities this election cycle. They also said Iran had carried out influence operations to fan political divisions and, quote, cyber operations targeting presidential campaigns. It backs up charges made by the campaign of Donald Trump earlier this month that Iran had hacked one of its websites. Those accusations triggered an FBI investigation. Trump at that time said Iran was only able to get publicly available information. Officials also say that Iran targeted Kamala Harris's campaign ahead of a Democratic presidential nomination acceptance this week. They revealed that Iranian operatives used social engineering to access key campaign figures, leading to theft and leaks aimed at swaying the election. Iran's mission to the UN dismissed the allegations as unsubstantiated, insisting it has no intention or motive to interfere in the US presidential election. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has agreed to a ceasefire proposal brokered by the United States. The Israeli government is accusing Hamas of dragging its feet in accepting the deal. Hamas is blaming Mr Netanyahu for the delay, citing new demands of keeping Israel's army and strategic points in Gaza. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Israel on Sunday in the hope of getting Israel and Hamas to agree to a ceasefire and hostage release deal. During his visit, Washington's top diplomat also held talks on Monday with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Isaac Herzog. After their sit-down, Blinken said that Israel had agreed to the U.S.-led proposal while calling on Hamas to do the same. In a very constructive meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu today, uh, he confirmed to me that Israel accepts the bridging proposal, uh, that he supports it. It's now incumbent on Hamas to do the same. And then the parties, with the help of the, the mediators, the United States, Egypt and Qatar, uh, have to come together and complete the process of reaching clear understandings about how they'll implement the commitments. Despite Israel's agreement, Blinken said that even if Hamas accepts the deal, a number of complex issues would remain for mediating nations and negotiators to work on, but did not elaborate on what those issues might be. But with past ceasefire deals failing, Israel and Hamas continue to blame each other for the lack of agreement. Hamas on Sunday accused Netanyahu of putting conditions on the deals that only benefit the military in prolonging the aggression in Gaza. However, Netanyahu on the same day stressed that Israel cannot just give and give, hinting that it's not willing to accept conditions put forth by Hamas. Meanwhile, Israel conducted airstrikes targeting a Hezbollah weapons depot inside Lebanon. Citing security sources, the strike did not result in any fatalities. However, Lebanon's health ministry said eight were injured, including two Syrian children. The Israeli military said that it conducted airstrike on a number of Hezbollah weapons storage facilities, adding that with the presence of secondary explosions, large amounts of weapons were destroyed in the attack. The latest airstrike is the second targeting Hezbollah weapons depot in the past three days, as the Israeli military targeted another on Saturday, leading to 10 deaths, including two children. Divers are still scoring nearby waters for six missing people after a super yacht capsized off the coast of the Sicily after a water spout hit in a freak incident. Among these missing is a tech billionaire Mike Lynch. In Sicily, they're searching for survivors. 50 metres beneath these now calm waters are the remains of a super yacht. A luxury vessel which was carrying 22 people when it was hit by extreme weather. Relentless rain and wind battered the north coast of Sicily in the early hours of Monday, causing widespread damage on the land and proving fatal at sea. The 56-metre yacht was carrying 12 passengers and 10 crew members when it got into trouble. 15 people, including 35-year-old Charlotte Golunsky, her partner and her one-year-old baby Sophia, managed to escape. But among those reportedly still missing, the boat's owner, British tech tycoon Mike Lynch. 
The 59-year-old entrepreneur had recently been in the headlines after he was cleared of all charges in a high-profile fraud case in the US related to the sale of his software company. It's believed his wife is one of those rescued, but there are local reports his 18-year-old daughter Hannah is also missing. As Coast Guard's firefighters and specialist divers continue to search for the missing, investigators are piecing together the yacht's last voyage. It had sailed from the Sicilian port of Malazzo on the 14th of August, making its way towards Porticello. By the 19th, the vessel was recorded as being anchored just off the coast near the village port. That's where it was when the storm hit, leading passengers scrambling for safety in the dark. As medics tend to survivors, authorities haven't given up on those still lost at sea. Divers have already found one body near the wreckage, and they know with every hour that passes, this rescue mission moves closer to becoming a recovery. A third strategic bridge in Russia's Kurs region has been attacked. Kyiv has not yet confirmed the third attack, but Ukraine's Air Force chief previously said its forces destroyed two other bridges in the region in order to weaken enemy logistics. A third bridge reported damaged by Moscow in its Kurs region, following Ukrainian attacks on two others on the river Same. This is Ukrainian President Zelensky says Ukraine is achieving its goals in its two-week-old incursion, announcing the capture of more Russian troops. We are achieving our goals. This morning we have another replenishment of the exchange fund for our country. The president characterizes the incursion as defensive, saying on Sunday that his forces aim to destroy as much Russian war potential as possible and to create a buffer zone on Russian territory. Targeting the few bridges that cross the river say may prevent civilians from evacuating and supplies from reaching Russian troops positioned in the Kursk region. Ukrainian forces claim to have seized over 80 settlements and more than a thousand square kilometers of territory there since crossing the border on the 6th of August. More than 120,000 residents have since fled the region, according to Russian officials. Further south, a Ukrainian drone strike set fire to a fuel depot in the Rostov region of Russia on Sunday. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces patrolled the country's Sumy region, launching attacks across to neighboring Kursk. Kremlin aide Yuri Ushakov said on Monday that peace talks were not an option right now. At the current stage, given this escapade, we will not talk. The Russian offensive continues to focus its efforts in the Donetsk region, edging closer to Pokrovsk a logistical hub for the Ukrainian military. Kyiv has ordered the evacuation of families with children there. Going for a short commercial break now, more world news right after this. Welcome back. Couples from all over the world graced the stage in Buono Air during a salon category of the World Tango Championship. As well as being dis a display of a talent, the championship continues to grow in international relevance as it sets a record for participation with 750 couples from 53 countries participating this year. Salon Tango is often characterized by measured and smoothly executed moves. The walk is considered the most important element. The competition takes place during the Tanko BA Festival, which began on Wednesday last week and will end on the 27th of August. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. Stay tuned as Anuradhi Vikramasinghe will join you next with the Nike Business Report. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.